Hello again. I'm Pastor Gary French from Life Renewed Ministries. Started teaching a couple of weeks ago, and if you were in tuned into last week's uh, teaching, you'll discover that I was teaching out of Galatians chapter one. Let me read a couple of uh, scriptures for you here, just to uh, refresh your memory. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And he gives his traditional greetings and he goes to in verse six and seven, which is where my main focus is eventually heading to. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And Paul adds these very insightful words, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, if you remember, as I said in the previous teaching, let me repeat this just a bit. Why am I sharing all this? And why am I sharing all of the, the this information? You have to go back and look at the earlier teaching. Why I'm sharing all this is because Paul knew who, who he was in Jesus, and he knew who called him. And as I said earlier, we have far too many folks in ministry today who merely use titles, thinking that the usage of titles uh, gives them a greater importance in the body of Christ. And from my personal observation, it seems like they're using that to support their own egos and their egos and their, and their self-absorption. I know that in my own life, my wife uh, is pretty uh, adamant about people addressing me as Dr. French because I have an earned doctorate, and she's more adamant about that than I. And I don't introduce myself generally as Dr. French unless it's at a special event. Uh, but it's not because I have an earned doctorate that qualifies me for the ministry. And I, I want to be very careful here. I don't mean to imply that people without a doctorate or without a seminary degree or Bible college degree or diploma, I don't mean to imply that uneducated people have no place in ministry. But there must be a sense, if a person is ministry in ministry, there must be a sense or an awareness that God is the one who has called them and God is the one who has qualified them. You could look at all of the diplomas I have and all of the degrees that I have, and you say, this guy spent a lot of money going to schools. And that would be partially true. But I didn't spend the money to go to school just to get the degree. I, I spent the money to go to these schools because I really believed in my heart. One, that God called me, God instructed me to. And number two, I wanted to be better prepared for the ministry. I, I know that there's some people, people that I highly admire. One is Andrew Womack, uh, who doesn't have a seminary degree or a Bible college degree. And yet he started a Bible college out in Woodman Park, Colorado, that I admire greatly. I admire him also greatly. But he went through his own personal Bible school, and he'll tell you that in his own testimony that it was about 29 years after he had already been in ministry for almost three decades that God prepared him to transition to start a Bible college and to do television and to expand his outreach. That's incredible to me to consider. He knew that God called him, but it took a long time to get to the place where he could be used in the manner in which he's being used today. We need to know that just because a person gives you a business card and says, I'm prophet so-and-so, does not mean that they're a prophet. I consider with me that I would not allow a person who claims to be a dentist, who has not been to dental school, to get anywhere near any of, any of my teeth. I, I wouldn't allow a person who says, I'm a surgeon, uh, to come and say, I need, I'm going to remove your... Uh, appendix for you, and I've got a special discounted price this week. No, I, no, that's not going to happen. In the same way, I wouldn't let a person that says, "I've, I've, uh, you know, I've flown airplanes on these games that I've got at home, and so I think I can. I'm qualified to fly for a major airline." No, I'm not getting on that plane. Think of it this way: Is the weekend golfer who shoots bogey golf? Are they ready to compete with the pro golfers? 
I don't think so. So here's what I see in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul knew who he was in Jesus, and he knew the one who called him. And it's because he knew who he was in Jesus, and he knew who it was that called him, he said, that's the reason I'm an apostle. But before that statement was written in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, and his conversion on the road to Damascus, the, the interlude, if I can call it like that, was several years. Now granted, he already had a foundation of the Old Testament, having been a Pharisee, but to be used by God, he had to unlearn what he had already learned, and he had to prepare his heart to serve the Lord in a new capacity. Consider that fact. Paul had spent years in devoted, intentional, and faithful service in the faith to Jesus before he embarked on his missionary duties. We could say it like this. He paid his dues and he proved himself. Paul did not just call himself an apostle. He proved himself to be an apostle. And I think that's, that's of greater value than a person saying, I'm a prophet. And you'll recall on the previous teaching I shared with you this young man who came to me to give me his word of knowledge of what God was doing or about to do. And this guy was about 20 and he was professing to be a prophet. I, I personally, I was a little offended by this kid. Paul's style in his letter, when you look at that, pardon me, when he says, he, he gives his introduction in Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And he starts in verse 6 and 7, and he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And then he adds in verse 7, it's not another gospel. And it's not something different, but it's, it's something that's being perverted by other people, this new gospel. His style and his, uh, his straightforward manner of his writing here is rather intense. And it's very critical of the people who were professing to know Jesus who had, and I've got to do it like this, you understand what I mean, secret knowledge and they were leading the young believers away from faith in Jesus, the transition from the opening lines of the greeting jumps right to the very heart of the problem in verses 6 and 7 that the believers were having. And I love that. He says, I'm, I'm amazed. I marvel. I'm stunned. I'm shocked. Uh, I'm gobsmacked, I suppose we could say, translate from the King James. Well, Consider with me in Acts chapter 14. Verses 21, 22, and 23. We have the, re the record of Paul and Barnabas' mission trip. And the record there is that they stopped at each of the new churches in southern Galatia. And the purpose for their stopping of these churches that they were instrumental in starting was to strengthen, encourage, and help them organize. And the phrase that he says, so soon, I marvel that you have so soon turned from or abandoned. It implies that there hadn't been a lot of time that had transpired from the establishment of the church to the return visit. Paul's concern was that from that moment of being born again and saying yes and starting the church, that and we don't know exactly how long it was, but so soon seems to indicate it wasn't a very long period of time. Paul was stunned. He was marveling that they had gone after and started following another version of the gospel. And it implies that they were easily swayed. And his concern was that the, the young believers were being turned away or enticed away from the message of the cross and the atonement provided by Jesus Christ to follow what he calls another gospel. <clears throat> Friends, due to the fact that Paul was keenly aware of his own personal calling and the powerful truth that Jesus is the Messiah and God the Father is the one that called him, he was certain of that. He was shocked that so many who had professed knowing Jesus would so quickly turn away from following Jesus. It, to me, it, it's the same way today. People will say, well, I need to get to church. And they get to church and they go to church and they have some warm fuzzies or they punch the ticket about going to church 
or they say yes to Jesus and some of them are baptized, uh, there are there, there's a mega church that I know that will uh, post how many thousands of baptisms or whatever number that they have annually. And a lot of those baptisms are people from other churches that have transferred membership. They're just baptizing or rebaptizing people that have been baptized again. And if you look at the history of their church, the number of people that have been baptized in their church, you would almost say for certainty the entire city of where, wherein they reside, the entire city should be believers in Jesus right now. But yet in that city, we have a huge problem with crime, with murders, uh, with deviant lifestyles, with homosexuality, uh, and the list just goes on. And, and in that very city, there's lots and lots and lots of churches everywhere, but we have a lot of people that are just living any way that they want to. Friends, it's not just about being baptized that gets you to heaven. It's not just about attending church that gets you to heaven. It's not just about having a business card that says, I'm a prophet or a pastor or an elder that clarifies you or qualifies you to be in the ministry. It's whether or not you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I think that's why we're seeing so many churches decline today. Uh, people lament the fact that the mainstream churches are declining in membership, and there seems to be a movement among a lot of people today to think, well, it's just important that you believe in something. Friends, it's not important to believe in something. It's important to believe in someone, and his name is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul says, I'm amazed, I'm stunned. And the verb to be amazed or to marvel or to be shocked at those who so quickly turn away from following Jesus is a word that was used by Jesus himself. And we find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus marveled, the Bible says, shocked, he was stunned, at the unbelief of the citizens of Nazareth, and yet he was also amazed, the same verb, at the fate of the Roman centurion. And it's a word that is thalmazo, and it's used, listen to this, 43 times in the New Testament, and 33 of those 43 times are found in the Gospels alone. And here's why it's significant. It's used to describe a human response or a reaction to the healing activity or the miraculous power of Jesus. It's like when you see God heal someone, you are amazed and it's like, wow, no one but God can do that. With that same kind of powerful emphasis, Paul uses it to underscore his, his amazement, his shock at how people who say, I know Jesus, and yet they stop worshiping Jesus. They start allowing mixture to come into their own personal life. So when Jesus was amazed at the people of Nazareth because they wouldn't believe, it was almost as if he was saying, how can you not believe? What more evidence do you need to see in order to prove or to convince or to change your mind or to overwhelm your heart to say yes? And for the Roman centurion, Jesus was amazed, not because this man did not believe, but because he chose to believe. This Roman centurion looked past his own personal background. He looked past his own personal bias. He looked past his own fear in order that he might come to believe. It, it was this, here was a man who had no foundation in the one true God who came to believe in the one true God versus those who professed they had a foundation in the one true God and yet they, they chose to reject the one true God. And then for Paul, here in Galatians, he was absolutely knocked over with a feather because even though the folks in Galatia had witnessed miracles, they had heard the gospel, they had seen the changed lives, they had experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of God in Christ Jesus, they had heard the message of the cross, they turned away from Jesus as being sufficient. Well, you might ask this as I did, well, what's at play here? What's at stake here? Well, what's at play here? 
is that Judaizers had entered the scene after Paul and Barnabas had left. And the young Christians were easily tempted away from faith and trust in Christ alone in order to follow false teachings. So what's at play here is a presentation of partial partial truth and total deception. What's at stake is the fact that the church was allowing the young church in Galatia, and it's true today, they were allowing a mixing of Judaism into their faith in Jesus. That's why Paul was so adamant. Paul was super clear that the other so-called gospel was not really the gospel, but a perversion of the message of the cross, a perversion of the life of Christ, a perversion of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this perversion of the gospel is always laced with partial truth, and it's saturated with mixture of messages. Okay, Pastor Gary, what are what are the, these things? All right, the partial truth is saying, yes, believe in Jesus. While the mixing of the message, the mixture, includes, but you also have to do the following. For the people at Galatia, they were being influenced by the Judaizers. They were saying, yes, you can believe in Jesus. Yes, he is the Messiah. But you need to obey uh, all of the laws uh, of Judaism. You need to get in line to observe all of the, the teachings of Judaism. You need to observe all of the holidays of Judaism. You need to go back to all of the festivals of Judaism. You need to observe all of the feasts of Judaism. And when you read Galatians, Paul is super abundantly clear that under the new covenant, the old covenant had been wiped away. Paul was flatly telling us that the new believers in Galatia, and he was addressing them clearly, there was no need to follow the laws of Judaism in concert with faith in Jesus. Uh, that sort of puzzles me today. Not, not that aspect of what I just spoke, but what puzzles me is that there's some people today that insist that instead of saying Jesus, we should say Yeshua. I have no problem with that. But it's also along the lines that we need to start observing uh, the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, that we should not eat pork. Uh, that we should uh, have uh, the first fruit offering. And it seems to be there's a mixture among so many evangelicals today that we need to turn away from faith in Jesus, the new covenant. And we need to return to the covenant of Judaism. I think that's what Paul was writing the letter to the church at Galatia about. And, And Paul was saying when you read the rest of Galatia, and we may just go through all of Galatians in this teaching. He was saying, I I don't follow those things anymore. Here was a guy who was a Pharisee. He called himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And yet he was saying, I don't follow those things anymore. Because he determined and he discovered that on the road to Damascus, when he encountered Jesus, he had been set free from the old covenant. Why do we want to return to the old covenant? Historians tell us that by A.D. 70, the Jewish rabbis had added 341 rules for daily life. Is that something that we need to go back to? Yes, say yes to Jesus. Yes, hallelujah to Jesus. He's my Savior. But we've got to follow these other additive laws. We've got to add all of these other things to it. I think that's crazy because that's not really a new covenant, is it? It's just the old covenant with a new bow on it. When I came to Life New Renewed Ministries about 12 years ago, I was at a time in my life when I was burdened by some decisions that I had made when I was a teenager, and I just carried a lot, around a lot of guilt and a lot of baggage. And when I came here, I realized that You know, God had forgiven me, whether it was for the sin I committed that day or if it was for the sin that I commit tomorrow. When you're a child of God, you're forgiven, and He forgives you even if you don't forgive yourself. So, I'm sorry for being emotional, but um, being a member of this church has taught me so much 
Even though I've been a Christian since I was 13, I gave my heart to the Lord at 13. I didn't really realize what it was to abide in Him, not just believe in Him, but but to make Him part of me, uh, to make Him my Savior. And that's what I learned. I learned how to let go of the baggage. Um, I learned how to be who God wanted me to be. So if you're wrestling with something in your life, this is the place to heal, to learn, to grow, and to dig deeper in the Word of God. He motivates you not in a way that the world motivates you, but He motivates you in a way that only God can. And it has meant the world to me as I now feel stronger and bolder and more confident and joyful in my walk with Christ. And if that is something you are looking for, Life Renewed Ministries welcomes you with a warm heart. Well, Paul's marveling, Paul's amazement at when he says, I marvel that you so quickly abandon the gospel to follow another gospel. His marveling, his stunned moment is revealed in at least two words when we read that very quickly. And, and I'll just, let me share that again. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And what I see in Paul right here, that marveling, it's revealed, his stunned moment is revealed in two words. The first one is, how soon you have been removed from him who called you. So it, I've already addressed how soon aspect, but in this consideration here, he's like removed and calling. The Greek verb, and, and I know some people are saying, just don't give me all this Greek stuff, just give me the King James. Uh, okay, I can do that, but uh, I think you're going to miss out on a lot of things. Having said that, the Greek verb here implies not just a past removal from Jesus, but he's talking about a continuing process. He's, he's, he's basically saying, you're being, you're being changed. You're being changed from the truth, the total truth, to follow a partial truth. In essence, it suggests are not changing just their mind, but they were turning away from what had been given to them in Jesus Christ. They were intentionally, willfully turning away from God. And friends, if you're going to turn away from something, you have to turn to something. In other words, what Paul is saying, the grave concern here is that the young believers were deserting belief in Jesus alone and the sufficiency of Jesus in order to follow, at, follow after some mystical belief, some addendum to the, the message of the gospel. And, and my friends, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, there is no addendum to faith in Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not the cross and then, okay, we got to add something that it's the cross. And it's the fact that Jesus hung on the cross for you and for me. He gave his life for us that, and I know the triumphs, that it might, that we might be set free. He gave us his life. My friends, sometimes we gloss over that or we read through it too quickly or we push it off to the side or or we discount it so easily. What's at heart here with Paul addressing the church, the young believers at Galatia, is nothing but apostasy. He's concerned about their turning away from Jesus Christ in order to follow a new gospel. And my friends, whenever a person who professes faith in Jesus attempts to add conditions to faith or to seek another, another path, they would say, yes, believe in Jesus, but you need to also believe in this other secret that I've discovered. And when you, when you go down that path, you trip intentionally into deception. You blind your eyes to the reality of Jesus. It's like the person who says, 
Yes, I've, I've discovered Jesus. And yes, the Bible is very dear to me. And you say, do you ever read it? And they said, no, I, I just don't have time. Or they say, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, because I don't have time, I'm too busy. Or they'll say, I, I haven't found the right version uh, to understand the Word of God. I haven't discovered the, the things that fit my lifestyle. Or the ones that go through there and they totally rip out pages or erase entire verses because it doesn't fit into their lifestyle. My friends, it's not that the Bible needs to fit into our lifestyle. Our lifestyle needs to fit into the Bible. Our life and our heart and our mind and everything about us needs to fit into the the paradigm, into the mold, into the message of the cross, into the power of the gospel, into the life-changing good news that Jesus alone saves. Oh, man, can I have an amen for that? He is the only one who was able to die for us, and he's the only one who is sufficient enough to take care of everything that we've got. And my friends, the shock that Paul displays here is due to the fact that God had called the Galatians to faith And now Judaizers who lived in the region were stressing not just faith in Jesus, but in works. In Acts 15, verse 10, Peter said that to live according to the law was too heavy a burden even for Jews to carry. How can any person who has been called by God to receive salvation to fall away is beyond me. Yet that huge concern for Paul 2,000 years ago is just concern, just as concerning for me today. My dear friends, I pray that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I pray that He's changed your heart and your mind. And he's given you purpose in your life. And I pray that you will be sure that you give your heart to Him today by saying a prayer that says, God, thank you for loving me and dying for me. Help me to be more like you. Forgive me for following my own path. I ask, Father, that Jesus come into my life My friends, if you pray a prayer like that, I know that God will come into your life when you just submit your will, you bend your knee, and you seek to follow Him. I would encourage you to find a a church, Bible-teaching church, Christ-honoring church to be a part of. You go to church, you go to worship this coming Lord's Day. I would encourage you to spend time in regular Bible study. If this ministry is a blessing to you, I would pray that you would reach out to us Our website is right there on the screen. Uh, And you can reach out to us and and, uh, drop us an email or drop us a line uh, for us to continue on the air. We need your financial support. But I'm I'm not asking you, I'm not begging for money. I'm just stating a fact. What I'm more concerned with is that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I pray that today is the day that you say yes to Him. Thanks so much for tuning in. I look forward to sharing God's truth with you again next time so that you might have a life renewed.